LinkedIn. I'm Dr. Kelly Monahan with the Upwork Research Institute, and I'm so excited to be sharing with you some brand new research we fielded around Gen Z at work, and also be talking with an esteemed group of leaders representing the entire workforce today across a variety of generations. So we can start talking about some real talk moments today around what the heck does it matter with a lot of our workplaces? Why is it so hard to engage the workforce? And most importantly, I want to hear from each generational leader here today on the phone to really understand how we can accelerate transformation within our organizations to bring more humanity at the forefront of the workforce experience. And so I'm delighted to be uh, joined by a group of panelists today. Christy, I'm gonna turn it over to you first. Would you mind introducing yourselves, introducing your generation and really where you stand on the current workplace today? Hey Kelly, it's great to be with you. So Christy Smith, I've spent over 35 years in consulting, primarily in consulting uh, around human capital issues. So leadership, culture, org design, all of those things. Um, I uh, come to this work very naturally uh, in that I've been studying, uh, like you, Kelly, uh, the issues re related to leadership. Today, I'm representing uh, the boomers, as painful as that is for me to say, but I will caveat to say that I feel like a Gen Z trapped in a boomer body. So I'm really excited to be here with you today. Hey, Lynn, I'd love to turn it over to you. Tell us a little bit about you, your generation, and what you think about the workplace today. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, everybody. I'm excited to be here. I'm Caitlin Bible. I am representing the millennials in this conversation. Um, I have been working in the media and event space for over 10 years, helping lead and build by coastal teams for some of the top global entertainment brands. I'm really excited to see where this conversation goes, because I think it is a pivotal moment in the workforce, especially post COVID as we rebuild what corporate America looks like to employees and corporate America itself. Um, and I live in Los Angeles with my fiance and our two cats. Love that. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for joining us today. Landon, hot topic today. Gen Z, we're talking about your generation. So why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you? Yes. So I'm Landon Bates and I am a social media coordinator. I've worked in social for about six plus years. I am representing Gen Z. Um, but on the flip side of what Christy said, I, I do feel like I am a boomer trapped in the body of a Gen Z man. But, <laughs> but yes, always happy to hold down the Gen Z fort. Love that. Well, thank you all so much. I'm going to get started, quite frankly, with a bit of a spicy take. So those of you who may have been following along on LinkedIn, I recently ran a poll and I asked all generations of workers, if given the choice, if you had enough stability, do you still want to work a nine to five kind of corporate traditional job or would you rather go into freelance or be an entrepreneur? And I'll be honest with you, I was really surprised by the results. An overwhelming majority said if given the choice, they would much rather work for themselves, be a freelancer today. So I'm going to start, Christy, I'm going to start with you. This is my hot take question. Really, when you think about this, has corporate America lost its allure of attracting the next generation of talent? And why is that the case? Why are more people looking to actually go into business for themselves than go get tied up with a corporate identity today? Yeah, I, I'm not surprised by the answers that you got, Kelly. And I think okay. the reason that um, corporate America or corporations globally, so I wouldn't yep. just limit it to America, I would say globally, are losing employees and engaged employees for a couple of different reasons. They don't have a compelling purpose. They're not living their values. Their insides don't match their outsides. They're not creating enough exciting opportunities. They're still locking people into job structures and not giving them the freedom to learn or to move or use their skills in different ways. And we only have to look to last year's Edelman uh, survey to say that, um, that organizations simply aren't earning the trust of their employees. It's at an all time low. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are some really key reasons why I think that most people would rather go work for themselves. Yeah. That's so fascinating. I appreciate that research you brought in. Caitlin, what's your perspective here? I mean, as we think about, you know, your generation, you're representing the millennials here. What is the general sentiment towards, you know, working in that nine to five job? And, and maybe why are we seeing in the polling results this loss of allure that has been traditionally the common structure of employment for the last decades? Yeah, I love this question. And it's funny, I talk about it often with my peers, as we're all sort of in this moment of the 
American corporate dream millennials were originally sold no longer really fits the framework of our lives or the social political climates of today. And we're all kind of wondering where we go from there because, you know, and I think Christy touched on it a bit. It's the values that have been, that have changed and recognizing how important our values are outside of corporate America, as well as flexibility. And I touched on it a little in the intro, but I think the post COVID world, everybody's looking for a little more flexibility. And a lot of these corporations are promising it, but they're not following through on those promises. And it's hard for us to find a place within corporate America that really is upholding what they say they are doing for the employees. And I think a lot of us, especially the millennial generation are trying to figure out what that now looks like for us after years and years of working that nine to five. And now we've opened our eyes and thought, oh, I don't know if I want this anymore. I don't think it fits my life. It's interesting, just right off the bat, for those that are listening on our LinkedIn community today, I'd love for you to join us in the chat and tell us what you're thinking as you're hearing this narrative. But I'm already seeing this cross-generational narrative between what Christy is saying about the insides not matching the outsides. Caitlin, that being your lived experience. And so Landon, I want to turn it over to you Tell me where your perspective is on this as a Gen Zer. Yeah, so as a Gen Z, I, I'm starting to see a major shift on what it looks like. I know for me personally, I joined the workforce in the midst of COVID. So mm. I graduated in 2020. And so that's all I kind of knew was the remote start. And so I think the standard of what corporate looks like still has some appeal. Um, like I still think it's the whole structure of it all is appealing. But I do think seeing these big, big name companies move with the times is more ideal. That flexibility in the remote style is something that I think my generation really values. And I think we'll start to see more companies get along with that as we continue to move forward. So I want to move on and I want to share some research that we just fielded. Um, it's breaking news research at the Upwork Research Institute. And so as, as a researcher, we know that we are motivated beyond pay. What I'm here to talk about and share is the research around the intrinsic motivations that also need to be true, that get us out of bed every day and make us excited about the workplace. And so we fielded this research recently to really understand the intrinsic motivators. Academics call this self-determination theory, but really the autonomy, the connection, the meaningful work that has to be true in order to get up and give our best every day. And I'm gonna be really frank with um, everyone here in the LinkedIn community. We're in a crisis when it comes to intrinsic motivation of what's driving the workforce today. You know, we went out and surveyed over 3,000 American workers in particular. We found today that business owners and Gen Z, who are what we're calling this portfolio careerist, managing a portfolio of work as opposed to necessarily just anchoring to one either company or project, are experiencing much higher levels of motivation. But across the board, it's fairly low. So, Landon, I'm going to actually start with you on this one. What do you think has to be true in the workplace today for you to get excited, for you to wake up and be like, yes, it's a Monday morning. Like, how do we get to that place? Right. Because we're spending so much of our lives there. What's your perspective? Totally. Um, I think for me, I feel like keeping the work fun and new. I know we're in this world of flexibility and remote work. So I think it is it is crucial to have that. But at the same sense, I think making sure that I, when I get up to come to work today, whether I'm at home or in the office, I want to make sure that I am enjoying what I'm doing. I'm excited about what I'm doing. And on that same flip, I also want to see that there is a bit of room for active growth, active room for growth um, and something that I'm working towards. So I'm, I'm getting up to make sure that I am know that this is a track. This getting up every day is tracking me, moving me closer and closer to the goals of progression and, and seeing more out of my job. So I think that's a big one for me is just continuing to move forward with growth makes me excited from the work. You know, Landon, I am so glad you said that. Um, obviously, this is organic and live right now. And so I think there's this, this misnomer too that you hear a lot in the media right now about Gen Z and whether it's the lazy generation or not wanting to get up and be motivated. But I heard you loud and clear and I'm seeing it in the data every human being is wired to learn. I mean, we release dopamine when we're engaged and we are at our best when we're learning. So I think that's so essential. Caitlin, real quick, I want to turn to you. What is getting you out of bed every day? So what do you think about you know, going to work? 
Yeah, definitely. This is a, a journey for myself that I've been on for a while of both separating my worth from my work and making sure I have other things outside of that. And then what does that look like for me to want to go to work? And for me, it comes down to empathy and authenticity. And by that, I mean, I'm looking for a leader and a team that is empathetic, that I'm also a human. And I connect with them on a level outside of just our job and our corporate role. And then I'm looking for a workplace where I can authentically be myself. Maybe one day I show up in a band tee and jeans at work, and that doesn't affect how productive I am, but I get to be myself and feel like I can show up as myself in the workplace. And I'm not a completely different Caitlin from nine to five. Of course, there are boundaries to that of what is professionally acceptable and what you keep for your personal self, but the ability to show up and feel comfortable in my own skin, in my own clothes, and get my work done and be valued as an individual amongst a team of empathetic individuals. What I love about what you just said, Caitlin, a couple of things is, is this kind of identity. Who am I without my job, right? Mm -hmm. I am working with so many C-suite individuals who are leaving the workplace or still staying in the workplace, who are now grappling with that same kind of identity crisis. And it is paralyzing. And when you think about that identity crisis, who am I if not this label or this you know, brand that I've been associated with, um, what does that mean? What does that mean for me? What does it mean for my relationships? What does it mean for my family? All of those things. Um, and then the second thing I think that is so um, insightful about what you talked about is this notion of, you know, bringing your whole self to work. We've heard that phrase for so long. And, and, and frankly, I think we're saying the wrong thing. <laughs> what I think is it's a great sentiment. But what employees want, and this is research that both Kelly and I have done, what employees want is the agency to define themselves in their own words, not be defined either by a group or by their profession and their competencies, but to be able to come to work and be who they are, but define that in their own words, not to be defined. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much, Christy. I think that's spot on. So Keelan, I want to come back to you because Quite frankly, you posted something on LinkedIn recently that went viral. Can you tell us a little bit about the post that you sent that went viral on LinkedIn and maybe some of the motivation you had for it? Yeah, uh, I hope people take a look at it so you can reference it. And we can put it in the comments too for people. Amazing. Live. Okay, great. Love it. And yeah, the post really took off and it was weeks of discourse and I really loved reading all the comments and there are thousands and thousands of them in the sentiment of the post. It's about being a millennial manager in the workforce and the flexibility and authenticity. I keep coming back to that because it's true in the workplace. And I, if you talk to any of my colleagues or my team, I am my authentic self all of the time. It's about being authentic in the workplace and realizing outside of corporate America we are people first and employees second. And I think that's why it resonated with everyone because a lot of these thoughts, I would say, especially for the millennial generation, we're starting to think but aren't voicing out loud, such as, hey, I have a doctor's appointment today. I can't make that meeting. My kids are going to be late for school. I need to take them. I will miss the meeting. Oh, I have therapy today. No, let's reschedule. Or, hey, let's take a break and go outside for lunch and not eat lunch at our desk and continue to just pump out work and be productive. And not that you're not being productive, but realizing people need breaks too. And we have lives outside of our nine to five and outside of sitting on Outlook and Zoom all day. Uh, so I think it really resonated with people. And I would say 90% of the conversation was positive and everyone was jumping on board and so excited to see this and having fun with it and adding their own extra lines of, oh, and I got to take my cat to the vet and, you know, how it resonated with them. And then, of course, we had people saying, well, is any work getting done? Um, you know, oh, you're allowing all of this flexibility. Does anyone ever show up? Is anyone responding? What's productivity look like? And my answer to those folks, and I understand to where they're coming from when to us, the nine to five has been so hammered into 
corporate America that you can't step away. You can't have a life, keep personal and professional separate. But I find my team to be more productive and really enjoy coming to work because I say, sure, you need to come in at 10, that's fine. Wherever, whenever you need to get the work done, as long as you're there when we need you, if we're working on a big project or a big event, I don't mind. I understand because I also want to go home at, you know, five o'clock or I also have things to attend to. Christy, I want to come to you and we'll make sure we put this in the link as well. But you did a TEDx a little bit ago on covering. And so like, I'm listening to Caitlin and I'm immediately going to your talk track on covering. Can you tell us a little bit about the theory of covering and how you came up with this and maybe like how it even started in corporate America to begin with or across all globes? Yeah. Yeah. The, the term covering, um, really was, um, founded, if you will, or first introduced to us by a New York University law professor, Kenji Yoshino, where he wrote his autobiography and this notion of covering uh, in his own coming out process. Covering mm -hmm. is really hiding any aspect of ourselves to the detriment of ourselves. And so what we found, uh, what I asked was, okay, Covering happens in life, get that, happens in the law, and that's been examined. What I wanted to know was, is covering happening in the corporate setting and in organizations? And if so, who's, who's making that happen? Who's forcing that? Right? Um, is it part of leadership that demands covering? Is it, you know, organizational culture that demands that? And what we found overwhelmingly was that people cover at work to the detriment of their sense of self. Um, and that it has varying degrees of impact on your sense of self, depending on you know, your uh, ethnic background, your religious background, your or sexual orientation, all of these things. You know, typically we will say, hey, I'm going out to a meeting that I've got to attend with a client when we're going to coach our, our kids soccer game. Right. Or, you know, we're going to, hey, I've got to step out for lunch when we're just go trying to go get our hair cut, for God's sakes. Right. Or that more severe, you know, with with much more severity that people are covering for either a physical ailment, ailment that out of out of the workplace, they might use the cane. And in the workplace, they forego that cane because they don't want to be seen as weak. Mm -hmm. Right or covering on mental health, which is huge right now, always has been, but, but enormous right now. So this notion of covering, while the research in the TED Talk was done several years ago, I continue to kind of look at this aspect of covering through research, and it's more prevalent today than it's ever been, and more detrimental. And it's leaders and the organizational cultures that they create that really are at fault here for creating those demands, if you will, of employees to cover. Mm. I think that's great. So we'll make sure, like I said, we'll get that in the comments to make sure those of you who are listening, um, definitely go share out Christy's TED Talk on that. It's alarming that the situation is getting worse, not better. And so, Landon, I want yeah. to turn it over to you now. As a Gen Z coming into the workplace, do you feel like you've got to cover parts of yourself, your identity? How does this conversation resonate with you? Um, I think so, yes, for sure. I do think there's a layer of professionalism that I think you have to just upkeep. Um, and I think sure. that's just part of what the status quo always has been. You kind of keep a, you have a work persona and you have a, outside of work persona. Um, and I think still trying to keep that professionalism, I do think we are trying to move towards, uh, this. I'm just Landon, and this is how Landon shows up at work. This is how Landon shows up when I'm going to dinner with my friends. And this is how Landon shows up when he's grabbing a drink at the bar. And I think that that is kind of where I'm, I'm moving towards. But I do feel a sense of covering that I have to still upkeep um, but I loved all that what you said, Christy. So, Landon, I want to ask one more follow up and I'm going to ask this to each of the panelists. I love what you just said, by the way. Like, it's landing at work, it's landing in the bar, it's landing at the gym, whatever else you're doing. You know, it, it's one, at the end of the day, we're, we're one human being and yet we fragment ourselves in so many different ways. So, like, to Christy's point, to our detriment and actually to the business performance detriment too, as well. So, Landon, what do you think has to be true about leadership today in order for you to feel totally landing at work? where you're not covering? Like, what do leaders have to change so you feel comfortable bringing yourself in that manner to work? And I feel like leaders just coming 
as leaders and just dropping the facade, making that very clear early on when you start to work with somebody. I think it's something that I appreciate because it just makes me feel comfortable. I don't know if it's like an like icebreaker. It just sounds so cliche, but just something that makes you feel like, OK, mm-hmm. I get you and you get me. This There doesn't have to be a professional hat of, of fakeness sure. that I have to put on. Um, I think that really will help me a lot or it helps me a lot. Yes. I love that. Caitlin, what about you? What has to change about leadership for you to be all in as yourself? Yeah. And I want to come at it from a point of view as someone who leads teams sure. and leader teams as well. I, you know, tried and true lead by example, and you will find me being the one saying, Hey, I have to leave early today. I have a doctor's appointment or I'm unavailable biweekly on Fridays from 12 to one, because that's my standing therapy appointment. And I slack that to my team. Hey, unavailable. Oh, I'm headed out to lunch. Do you need me to pick you up anything? So I put it out there and show them who I am as an individual. And I'm not hiding as Caitlin at work, stealing Landon's (laughs) phrase there. Um, So I like to lead by example so that I'm creating the safe space for them that I didn't always have as I entered the workforce and came up in the industry. So for me, it's just showing uh, showing up authentically myself as a leader. Mm, I love that. Christy, what do you think has to be true about leadership today? Yeah, Kelly, um, that's the uh, $60 million question, right? Um, You know, so uh, I'll give you a shout out, Kelly. Kelly and I are uh, releasing a book a little later on uh, this summer, and it's called Essential, How Distributed Teams, Generative AI, and Global Shifts are Creating a New Human-Powered Leadership. And in that book, we really look at 10 principles for essential leaders. Um, First is the mindset of leaders need to change, right? Um, the We need to move from emotional intelligence to emotional maturity. So what is emotional maturity? Suspension of self-interest, insatiable curiosity, abundance versus scarcity mindset, and community orientation, right? <laughs> the behaviors around that have to be about building trust and transparency. How do we build bridges across generations. So much of what's been said today, I relate to as a boomer with, you know, both Caitlin and Landon, right? So building those bridges, being intentional about what we're listening to and for, and then building um, that into operations. So creating a culture of excellence and what does that look like? New rules around that, not a full Outlook calendar, but rather space in there for humans to be and to listen and to engage. Predictability, you know, meeting flexibility. And we've talked a little bit about this. And most importantly, and Caitlin, you talked about this, it's it's that contextual competence that we need to have. Like as leaders, we need to demonstrate, hey, I'm going to a therapy session. You know, I'm not going to be here out there. Or when we're We're working with our colleagues and employees, understanding the context of what they're dealing with in their lives. I talked to one of my colleagues this morning whose wife was, you know, rushing off to see her parents who were both failing and what he had to turn around in his work uh, life to be able to accommodate that. That's more of what we need from leadership today. Yeah, I love that. I want to end on this one question. It might be a little philosophical. So, Christy, I'm going to start with you and then and then go down here. Uh-oh. I'd love to hear from each generation, like in a in a perfect world, if we're going to have actually have this come about at scale and have lives, we're excited, we're intrinsically motivated. Caitlin, like you said, you're modeling the leadership that enables flexibility. What then is the purpose of business? And how do we really think through maybe a higher order of what we should all be chasing? So, Christy, I'm going to start with you. What do you think we need to reframe when it comes to this, the very purpose of business itself? Well, let me answer that by saying what needs to be the same and what needs to be reframed. reframed. You know, we in businesses are driving products, are driving the economy to be at a place where hopefully, you know, we will get to a place in a mindset where all boats rise. I mean, you know, businesses are meant to drive the economy and to grow and to flourish. That really needs to stay the same. How we do it needs to change dramatically. 
You know, there was a great article, I think it was in The Economist today, about Americans and Europeans. Americans make more money and Europeans have more time. And what's better or what's worse? It, it really articulated this drive in especially the American culture mm. of work, 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 work at no cost, all type A's, got to, you know, run, you know, yourself into the ground. That has to change. Mm. There's no question about that. We people can work hard, but they need their lives. In Europe, there's talking more of an emphasis on time doing your work, but making that time and space to be engaged in the world, to travel, to be engaged in your kids' lives, to be engaged in, in friendships and all of that. I think we need a perfect blend of both. Mm. Love that. Caitlin, as a millennial here, a millennial leader, what do you think? What do we have to reimagine about work itself? Yeah, definitely a philosophical question for the ages. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of European teams and on a lot of European events. And I like what Christy said about how they maximize their time at work, but also so that they have time outside and what that looks like. And we always joke when we go to Europe, I was just in Italy that I would, you know, love to move there and have the vacation time they do. <laughs> but I think it comes down to a lot of what we've summarized here is that Corporate America functions on all of our productivity and bottom line is what's best for them. And I understand that. And for capitalism to continue moving, we need that. But I think companies also still need to realize they need their employee base and they need them to feel like they want to wake up on Monday and come to work and work for that company to keep it productive. So I think on a leadership level and even higher up, they really need to start reflecting on what all of us are saying here, or they're going to continue to see people lose motivation and lose employees. And we're all going to start freelancing. So <laughs> I I think it's corporate America really does need to listen to their employees and these new generations coming up who are saying, hey, whoa, hold on a second. This isn't what I want to do. And, and they mean it. Yeah. And Lana, before I, I go to you, I just want to plug one more data point, Caitlin, based on what you said, because I think that's so profound. You know, in our research, we're studying those that Gen Z that already have a post-grad degree, they are more likely to be opting for freelance and entrepreneurship type roles than they are the traditional nine to five. So what you just said resonates and mm -hmm. something we're already seeing transpire in real time within the economy, which at the end of the day, too, like as a capitalist and, you know, someone who's in business, Innovation and entrepreneurship is so important to the life of our economy and to solving these massive problems we have. And so I do think this is a step in, in the right direction. But Landon, I want to end on you. You're the Gen Z here. In a perfect world, where are we headed as a business and what can we get better here? I, I just wanted to touch on as well. I, I feel like in my last corporate role, we spent so much time filling out these surveys how can the company improve? You know, you, it's like this, these 40 questionnaires. And I feel like you you do that two hour block of questionnaires and then you think you have all these great ideas and nothing comes of it. Yeah. And so I, like you said, Caitlin, listening to your employees is key. Um, and I know for myself and my peers, it's, it's, it is, it's making it where the world is at now is making it easier to not have to depend so heavily on that corporate gig to start to see the lifestyle that you want to see. And so I think if if leaders want to continue to retain their younger audience and people that want to work for their companies, I think it, it does have to be a sense of listening to the people that are under you and, and actually valuing those opinions that come. Because it, at the end of the day, those are your workers. That's who you have to depend on. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm all for the really listening to the internal and nope, not wasting our time with these questionnaires, actually making some use of them. So Landon, I'm so excited about your generation and I want to land, um, on you. So tell us, I know there's something that you've got around Gen Z and innovation. What's top of mind as we close out today? Totally. So I, I think a misconception they have about Gen Z is that we are the, like you said earlier, we are the lazy generation and I just have to combat that because while I, I don't think that we are lazy, I think what we kind of are is we work smarter rather than working harder. Um, I saw this TikTok going around where it was um, a boss asking like Gen Z interns to give them, give the boss 50 pages of paper, however they wanted to give it to them, give the boss 50 pages of paper. And so um, 
some of the millennial workers were counting out 50 pages of paper and then just giving it to them while the interns like literally just went into like Microsoft Word and printed off 50 pages of paper and just handed it to them while, rather than wasting like the time counting it out. And I just think that example just goes to show like, it's not laziness. We are just innovative. And I think that is one of the cool things about our generation. And I think I wish that misconception could be changed. Landon, thank you so much for sharing with that. And I want to close out today and I want to invite the LinkedIn community who joined us today. Join us in the comments. Please make sure you're following Christy, Caitlin, and Landon. They are here leading their generational pathways. And Landon, I am so excited about Gen Z coming to the workplace. As an elder millennial, I feel like we were starting to raise some of these issues, but we weren't so bold and powerful to actually start breaking these paradigms as your generation is. So we welcome it. Christy, you've been such an inspiration to me as a leader as well, really modeling and showcasing a different way to lead. And Caitlin, I'm so inspired by the way that you're leading within your organization. So thank you for all who have joined us. Gen Z is here. They're ready to come into your workplaces. Let's, as leaders, make sure we're embracing them. Take care.